Hi, I'm Aiden from Core Electronics, and today we're going to be taking a bit of a closer look at the user interface of Cura 2 Lulzbot Edition, which is the new software package that has been updated by Lulzbot. If you haven't got Cura 2 yet, take a look at our previous video, which went through the process of installing Cura 2 onto a Windows 10 PC. It's not quite as straightforward as you might think. Once you've finished that and upgraded your firmware, jump into this tutorial, which is titled Cura 2 Lulzbot Edition Overview for Beginners. At the top of the page, you'll find a labeled version of the Cura 2 user interface, and it's a really good quick reference guide for the duration of this video. The rest of the things that we're gonna do here are gonna take place in Cura, so we'll jump over there now. Okay, so here I am and I've loaded up Cura 2 uh, from the shortcut on my desktop. Once it's loaded up, I have already installed my Lulzbot Mini as the default printer for Cura, so you can see that the Lulzbot Mini's bed is there really quickly. If you right click, you can rotate around the center of the bed. Middle click lets you pan around and middle button scroll will actually zoom in and out of your model files. What we're gonna do is, the first thing we've got to do is load up an STL model. So to do that, we click on the open file button and we can navigate to our STL file. Now be aware that this is the supported file types for Cura. So if you don't have your uh, STL file or your 3D model file in one of these formats, it just simply will not appear in this view. So you may have downloaded it from Thingiverse or another 3D model library online and you'll have to actually extract it before you can open it up. In any case, we'll open that one up. You'll get a short message down the bottom here and then we'll see the Roctopus or your STL model load into the center of the bed. Now, at present, I still don't have any of these options available to me and that's because I haven't selected a model. So if I left click on the model, I can see there's a light outline to the model and that means it's selected and I'm currently in the move mode as you can see here. Over here, it tells me the current coordinates of the center of the model and they're at zero, zero, zero. And I can easily move that model around by holding in the left button on my mouse and just simply moving it around the bed. Beware though, if you do move something slightly outside of the printer bounds, it will throw this error and tell you that it's not fitting inside the build volume. If it is over there, uh, you've put it somewhere and you've gotten a bit carried away, you can right click the model and click on center selected model and it puts it straight back into the middle after it orients itself again. You can deselect by clicking anywhere around the model as well. While we've got that model selected, we can also drop into the scale option. Now this allows you to simply scale your model however large you'd like it to by clicking and dragging on any of those axes. Usually when we're scaling 3D models though, we want to do it by a very precise amount. The better way to do that is just to simply enter your scaling factor into here. So if you wanted it to be 10% larger than it normally is, you'd simply enter 110% and press enter. As we've got uniform scaling selected, you'll see that it automatically has changed the Y and Z scalings for that one as well. Another handy little tip is if you want to print your model as large as possible, simply click max, scale max, and in that current orientation, that is as big as that model can be. Beware though, if you do, uh, if you can rotate it or move it in some way, it usually will allow you to get a little bit bigger of a print. So that's something that's interesting to know. We can also click reset, which drops it straight back to 100%. Do note that if you're trying to move the model, you need to actually be in the move mode. If you're trying to scale it, you need to be in the scale mode and so on. You can't actually move the model if you're trying to scale it, which is simple, but sometimes you forget what mode you're in and you'll be dragging it in and out like that. Moving into the rotate option, we can actually rotate our model in all three axes. You can see that the X axis is the red axis here. So we can rotate it about the X axis, which is actually the left to right axis in the center of the model. Just like that, we've got 360 degrees of rotation there. Uh, we can rotate it in the Y axis, which is about that axis there. So we can do a spin like that. Using the reset button, we can drop him back to where he was. And finally, we can do it around the Z axis, which is probably one of the most uh, frequently used ones, just because it allows you to face your model where it needs to be facing. Again, we can reset that. And if you were to have your model um, import on a funny angle, you can use the lay flat button which might take a bit of computation time, but it will also lay your model as flat as possible, which can be helpful sometimes. But it will do its best to do so anyway. There we go, so it's laid that model flat, as flat as it can be. Next thing we'll look at is the mirror mode. So in this mode, 
you actually have the option of mirroring your print, your STL file, in any of the three axes. Just like with the rotation, you could do it in three axes. This is the same thing. So we can click on the green to mirror it in that axis, the, the red and the blue to simply flip your model. So that's all good. We can reload the model's uh, position and it should revert it back to how it was. Oh, transformations, there we go. Positions. So there are some quick options there in the right click menu. Uh, finally, we'll take a look at the multiply objects. So be aware, this is the number of copies that I want to put onto the bed, not including the one that's there. So I want one copy. It should put two octopuses on the bed. Now, if they can't fit, considering where that first model is already located, it will do this, which we saw before when you move something outside the printable area, it just goes stripey like that, meaning it can't be printed. Um, but be aware, you can sometimes move things around and fit them in yourself. So now that we've got those few things sorted, they're all the ways that we manipulate our models around the bed. And there's a few reasons that you would do that. Sometimes it's for part strength and other times it's for support. Uh, sometimes it's for the amount of surface area of your print that's touching the build plate. It allows for greater adhesion. It means that your prints aren't gonna pop off mid print and cause a failed print. There's a ton of reasons we'll get into those in future videos. Um, the next thing that you'll need to do when you first load up Cura, uh, you've got, we've got two little octopuses here. But to successfully uh, print these models, we're gonna need to select what filament we're using. Now, filament selection is pretty much based on what you have. We've got some Polylite PLA here, which is one of our favorite PLAs uh, made by Polymaker. So that's our filament of choice today. So we need to tell our slicer software what filament we are trying to print with. And luckily for us, Polylite PLA is supported by Lulzbot, and so they have their own profile for it. So just in the category section on the right of the workspace here, click on all, then drop into the material checklist, and you can see there's a ton of materials available but we're looking for Polylite PLA there. And finally, we select our profile. Essentially with 3D printing, you have speed and or quality. Um, there's a standard print setting for this filament type, the standard profile, which is a bit of both. It's quick, but it looks good. Then there's the high detail, which is looking, it looks far better, but it takes a bit longer, and the high speed, which is the opposite end of that spectrum. So for example, let's do a high speed print and that's all set up. So now the printer knows what quality settings, what speed settings, and what filament we'll be printing with. It knows what models we're printing and what, how we want those printed. Now we just have a few more options before we can slice and save our file. So in the print setup, these are all the quick setup options for 3D printing. Now infill percentage is essentially the amount of plastic that is filled in to the center of your model. Now to demonstrate that, I can actually go to the layers view. So up in the top of the workspace, there's layer, uh, view and layers, or I can click on this little eye and go to layers that changes everything to that and I'll change to line type. So now we can actually see the different line types. We're currently set to a 20% infill, but I'll set it to zero just to show you the difference. So essentially a 0% infill shows a hollow model. So it's just printing the shell of the model, nothing in the center, 20%. 20% of the infill will be plastic and the other 80% will be air. So we'll have a look at what that looks like there. So you can see that there and there are all the different um, filament extrusions there. That's the best virtualization of what's happening. And obviously we'd go for something like solid 100% infill, which would make your part very strong, but also use a lot more filament. So it's something to be aware of. We found that um, if you want a really strong part that's not 100% infill, because it can take a lot longer to print, you can go for a setting around 70 to 80% and it is quite quite robust. And there we go there, so that's 100%. And if we scroll through it, you can see that it is uh, alternating those diagonal lines all the way through the print. And it would be a completely solid little octopus. The next setting is generate support. Now that is something that we need to look at in the solid view mode and we'll rotate down to a low point here. So you can see underneath the eyes of the octopus and underneath the palm there, there are some red marks. Now those red marks are pretty much highlighting the overhangs in this STL file. 
essentially the slicer saying, be careful of these parts of your model because they are printing without any support underneath them. And the basis of FDM printing is that it's printing on a pre-printed material. So from the first layer up is always building up upon something. If something's overhanging outside of that, you need to print support material, which is additional material that holds that little part up and can be removed after the print. And the Roctopus does print without supports. And finally, we have build plate adhesion. So the Lulzbot Mini, the TAS-6, the TAS-5, all of the Lulzbot printers come fitted with a glass, um, borosilicate glass bed with a heater underneath and PEI on top. Those two things together allow the filament to stay hot when it's extruded and the PEI allows it to cling to it really well. And that really helps with build plate adhesion. But there are some filaments that are quite tricky. And to take care of those filaments, we use build plate adhesion options. So by default, we've got the skirt selected and that's just that blue outline that goes around our models. It also helps to prime the extruder so the extruder will be wiped off clean, come to the front of the print bed and then start printing that skirt first. Uh, usually by the end of the skirt, you know that oh, you can see that plastic is cleanly extruding and then it can start the prints knowing that that's happening. That's important to have. And usually we just print with skirts. It's only when we're printing with advanced filaments that we probably need to whack on a brim or a raft. Speaking of those, we'll go to brims now. Essentially a brim, and we'll see it come up when it finishes slicing, are just extra outlines that emanate from the bottom of your model, that first layer, just like this. Um, and they increase the surface area of your model. So by increasing the surface area, you can sometimes, or a lot of the time, increase how well it adheres to the bed. This is probably my second most used build plate adhesion option past skirts. And they are quite easy to cut off, but they do take some time to remove as well. It's not like they just peel away simply. Sometimes you have to peel them away and then tidy it up a bit with a hobby knife or something. Uh, finally, we've got the rafts. So this is the final option and it's actually bought the entire bed printable area in a bit. So we'll delete one of the models and see what happens when we slice with rafts. Okay, so with a raft, you can't see any difference here. It looks normal, but if you look there, you can see that there's some extra gray under the model. It's like the print is sitting up a bit. We'll go to the view mode, look at layers and you can see that that is what a raft is. So it's essentially a less dense um, few layers underneath the print that allows it to adhere better to the bed. One, it increases the surface area and it makes it solid. You also get your print uh, printing on directly onto plastic rather than onto a different medium. So it works a lot better. So we're gonna go and put on those skirts. So we'll just put skirts back onto our model, change back to our solid look. Look at that cool little octopus there. Uh, finally, we have selected all of the options that we need. So it's a 20% infill, it's got supports, but they're not actually doing anything. We've got PLA selected at a high speed and it's ready to save to file. Down the bottom right of the screen, you can see that the model uh, is called LM underscore Roctopus. So that's the Lulzbot Mini underscore Roctopus, which you can edit if you want to by clicking that button. Um, if you were using a TAS-6, it would be LT-6 down there or LT-5 for a TAS-5. It's simply the name of the printer or the name that you gave that printer. We call it Lulzbot Mini, if you recall, and then the model file name. Underneath that, we've got the bounding box volume. So if there was a box that went around this print, that would be its volume. To the left here, we've got the print time. That's an estimate. It's usually pretty accurate. And to the right of it, we've got the filament uh, necessary to be able to print this. So it's 0.84 meters of filament or around six grams of filament, which can be handy if you're running out, running low on a reel, you can weigh it and see what you've got. Uh, if you mouse over that time as well, you can actually see a breakdown of all the different times. So that's quite a cool little thing to see. So we're happy to print that model. All we need to do now is one of two things. We can save that to our file. It's a G code file. Like I said, that's what our slicer does. It prepares a G code file. So I can save that one. I could save that directly to an SD card or I can copy it to an SD card and put it into my printer and select it and it will print. The Lulzbot Mini doesn't have an SD card slot, so we have to print tethered. So to do that, we can simply click into our Lulzbot Mini. There we go. And so our print's starting now. That's all it takes to get, uh, get started with Cura 2.6. It's not too different to Cura 21.08 or any of the legacy versions of Cura. It's actually quite easy to use. 
Uh, in the future, we're going to do a bit of a deeper dive into some of the custom options that we didn't even look at there. They're a bit hidden and it will be quite a good video because it will go through a lot of the new features in Cura 2.6 or Cura 2 Lulzbot Edition. Thanks for watching guys. If you have any questions about anything we talked about in this video, please leave a comment below and we will get back to you as soon as we can.